Good evening, everyone. Myself, Dr. Vinod Kaushik, on the behalf of IIP India Digital Team, just welcomes you all. I just showed my gratitude towards IIP India President Dr. Sanjeev K. Jha and IIP Women's National Head Dr. Ruchi Vasnai for providing us this wonderful platform for sharing the knowledge. Today, the topic of webinar is the return of sports after lower limb injuries. It's organized by IAP Nagpur District Maharashtra branch. And today the moderator of the webinar is Dr. Devyani Thakre. Ma'am is EC member of IAP Nagpur branch. Now I would just uh, request everyone, please subscribe IAP India YouTube channel and subscribe other social media pages of IAP India. And now I will hand over to Dr. Devyani Thakre. Please continue with your webinar. Thank you, sir. A very good afternoon from the Indian Association of Physiotherapists, Maharashtra State and Nagpur District Branch to all the participants, all the respected guests and all the seniors. I, Dr. Devyani Thakre, Executive Committee Member, IAP Nagpur branch and moderator for today's webinar welcome you all for the session on the topic return to sports after lower limb injuries the challenges a very informative session by Dr. K. Ganeshan sir welcome sir before we start with the webinar I would like to give a brief introduction of Indian Association of Physiotherapists and thank the whole team of IAP from central level to Maharashtra state level and Nagpur district level for organizing this webinar. The IAP functions under the guidance of Dr. Sanjeev Jha sir, the President IAP, Dr. Suresh Babu Reddy sir, Vice President Dr. K. M. Annamalai sir, General Secretary, Dr. Ruchi Vashne ma'am, Treasurer IAP, Dr. Sudeep Kale sir, CEC West Zone, Dr. Neha Shah, Joint Secretary West Zone, Dr. Achal Vashi sir, CC West Zone. The Maharashtra team, state IAP team effectively working under the presidentship of Dr. Ujwal Eole sir, Vice, uh, Vice President Dr. Amit Gire sir, Dr. Bharti Dave ma'am, Secretary, Dr. Suchita Bolar, Treasurer, Dr. Darshana Trivedi ma'am, Joint Secretary and Dr. Mansi Mehta, Joint Secretary. The Executive Committee member Maharashtra team includes Dr. Suvarna Ganvir, Dr. Sanjay Rajhans, Dr. Sohan Selar, Selkar, Dr. Suraj Kanse, Dr. Rahul Deshmukh, Dr. Snehal Patel, Dr. Uthra Mohan, Dr. Asmita Moharkar. It gives me an immense pleasure to introduce Nagpur District IAP team, which is tirelessly working for the profession. The Nagpur District IAP team is privileged to have Dr. Manisha Deshpande ma'am as the convener, Dr. Avnish Manekar sir as secretary, Dr. Subodh Patle treasurer, Dr. Umanjali Damke ma'am as the executive committee members, Dr. Shilpa Chaurasia ma'am, Dr. Mitain Mohta, Devyani Thakre, Dr. Kiran Mende ma'am. Coming to the today's webinar, the today's webinar is being conducted by uh, the Nagpur District Indian Association of Physiotherapists and a brief introduction of the well-known resource person, Dr. K. Ganeshan, sir. Sir doesn't need any introduction, but a few words in his qualifications and achievements. Sir is an excellent sports physiotherapist and a mentor. Also, the topic he is covering today is quite interesting and useful in our clinical practices. Sir is a sports physiotherapist with 16 years of experience. He is a trainer in Matt Pilates and reformer-based exercise from Start Pilates Canada. Kinesiology tapping practitioner uh, is about uh, for about 10 years. Trainer in Germany from K Active. Currently, sir is heading the Department of Physiotherapy and Sports Medicine in Ortho One Orthopedic Specialty Center, Coimbatore. He is also hey. associated with League Football at Chennai Football Club former team physiotherapist for Chennai Cheetahs for the World Series Hockey. Sir has been working with sports club and individual sports person at grassroots level. He has served as a board member with Ramchandra Medical College, Chennai for the Department of Sports Sciences. Sir, we welcome you and I would hand over the session to uh, Dr. K. Ganeshan, sir, to start with the webinar. Um, thank you, uh, team. Uh, it's a 
privilege to be part of uh, the uh, IAP and to be presenting uh, this uh, webinar. So uh, thanks Devyani and uh, thanks uh, Mithin for uh, taking the initiative and making this happen. Uh, it's very nice to hear a lot of the names what you mentioned in the panel and uh, I can remember many of them whom I've met and worked with and interacted over a long period of time and uh, nice to see you Devyani grow up from the days when I started knowing you. So it's really a great honor to be now. Uh, I'm just starting my... It's visible? Yes, sir, visible. Please carry on. Okay, so... Good evening, everyone. So the topic what I uh, picked is uh, written to play uh, the challenges what uh, a therapist can uh, face. And uh, when you are a hardcore uh, sports physiotherapist or dealing with people who play even a recreational sports, it's a very difficult uh, decision making uh, process. So the first question most of the people who come to us when they are an athlete is when can I get back to playing? And uh, most of the players or uh, the patients want a timeline or they need a specific date where they want to uh, go. And uh, on, on making those decisions on the first uh, uh, clinical day is, is sometimes very difficult because you don't know the extent of injury and uh, how the prognosis is going to be. So that's a... Uh, difficult task, but I've made certain processes and hopefully it can help you in your decision making. So the first thing you have to remember is your rehab, what the patient expect is, it's going to be a straight line with no hurdles, but actually how it is going to be is there is going to be a phase where there's going to be a lot of ups and downs and only then you will be uh, reaching your destination. And if you uh, look at the uh, aspect of the uh, function and the pain, which uh, is the criteria, there is going to be a improvement in the function and there is going to be a downward uh, progression of the pain. And uh, when you see the pain starting going down and getting decreased by two weeks or three weeks, the patient might feel that, okay, my pain is not disappearing, but you need to know that even if there is going to be a small changes, that is the process which is going down. And then you start going down. But in that meanwhile, you would have improved the range of motion, strength and uh, function. So this has to be shown to the patient saying that this is how your rehab is going to be. And this is how you're going to improve, you go back to your game. And if you look at the patient, I show this and tell them, okay, when you say you want to play, what do you mean? Is this uh, what you want or is this what you want? The top of the pyramid or the bottom of the pyramid? Yes, this is our last goal, but we need to start stage-wise. The first stage will be when you have no pain and you can start some activity and then you progress to playing the sport with low intensity and then progress to play and then go on to competition level. The... Uh, earlier traditional uh, method, how people return to sport was uh, a time base where they will say, okay, you can go after three months or you can go after two uh, weeks. And it used to be focused on the structure that is involved, whether it's a hip, back or a foot. And it will usually be a yes and no. And people will look at it's going from point A to point B. And most of the decision making was... Uh, based on the doctors or the medical professionals instructions saying that, okay, you can go. But now the approach is changing where we have clinical criterias, we have functional criterias, and there are various aspects that is going to come into play, whether it is going to have the uh, coaches involved, the uh, team members involved, and uh, the parents involved. And the decision-making is going to be a uh, 
a team decision where the medical profession is going to tell what is uh, uh, important in that and what are you looking at and how you can make a decision making. So it is not a single decision making now. So anybody who plays and gets injuries and plays again get injuries, it is a normal process of playing. So the first thing criteria we should be looking at is return to participation that you can just play or you're fit enough to start playing, not at a higher level, but at a lower level. Then you start playing active sports and then you start going on to performance. And the process will have tissue healing. You can have tissue damage. Again, there will be healing, again damage, but the process keeps going on. So why do we think uh, uh, so much when you want to put a player back onto uh, sport? One, if there is a re-injury or if there is a, a pain coming back, sometimes the patient might think that uh, this particular medical profession is not good enough, his uh, clinical skills is not good enough. And from the player's perspective, if you delay the sport, if he is a professional, it is an end of career and his performance can go down because he can start doubting himself that whether he is uh, good enough or not. If you put him early, there is a chance of having a <coughs> re-injury and long-term morbidity that he can damage something which is not repairable. Then uh, again, you, you lose the career uh, of the particular player. So to find a balance between <coughs> getting delayed and early is the key where you make a decision. So uh, this sort of a model, everybody will be aware of where for an athlete, you have the medical profession, the coaching staff all play a important role. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you see that from the clinical perspective, you have criteria of age, height, weight, that's your body composition. And then you have your range of motion, your coping strategies, your proprioception, postural control, all those things, aspects coming. And then you go on to the training aspects, <coughs> what kind of a training he needs, how he is improving on his training. Those kind of aspects come into play. There is also the motivational aspects. Only all these skills are interlinked in various ways and they all have to be addressed before you go on to a performance level of sports. And if you see from the stage wise, as the rehab goes in time, you can have various stages where you clear them that, okay, you have minimum risk. You can now clear to go on to the next level of rehab. So you progress it gradually and do a re-evaluation at each stage. So you can decide on the each stage depending upon what you are looking at. So if I'm going to look at improving the flexibility at the first stage, you know that you can work on the flexibility in one week to two weeks. You work on that two weeks, do a re-evaluation, put the next goal, and then you work on strength component. Okay, now from the strength, you do a re-evaluation and see whether you are. So at the end stage is when you are going to go back onto the active sports. So what can be the criteria as I showed in the uh, graph earlier? So it is individually <coughs> characteristic. So it depends upon the individual, what age they are, sex, what kind of an injury they are carrying, and whether you can use any uh, protective equipment, which can uh, slightly give us an advantage to get back onto the sports, what kind of sports they are playing, whether it is a foot or a knee, whether there is a pivoting or a non-pivoting. So if you are looking at an ankle uh, or a knee, let's take an example of an ACL. If there is uh, going to be a running uh, game, so I know that it is more of a linear uh, movement, not much pivoting going to happen. So I can put that patient a little more earlier into a training phase and maybe get him back onto sports earlier. But whereas if it is going to be a footballer or a badminton player, I need more time because there is going to be a pivoting activity, which is not uh, a, a conducive one for uh, an ACL injury. Then the level of activity, elect, competitive and recreational. Uh, in these three groups, the recreational ones are the people who just play for fun and to keep uh, fitness. Whereas competitive and elite are competing at uh, state level and national level and international level. But if you look at the competitiveness, that means how much a recreational and a competitive all do the same 100 percentage. 
a recreational player will also put in 100 percentage effort to take a, a smash shot or retrieve a ball when playing tennis just like a international the only thing is the amount of fitness uh, capacity what they carry is different uh performance level is your match uh, statistics where the coaches will tell that uh, this uh, particular player's forehand is good his uh, matches in the last uh, six months he is ranking as this those kind of things come into play then uh, timing and duration of sports participation after any injury is uh, critical uh, that decision making we will see so <clears throat> some of the other criteria is going to be your objective uh, assessment what we do in our uh, clinical uh, setting and uh, you can have some subjective assessments there are various uh, uh, scoring methods which is available uh, the validity and uh, the sensitivity specificity of these tests again are there in the uh, literature and uh, you need to uh, evaluate uh on your personal experience and see the progression where you do a pre test and a post test after your rehab and then based on that you progress them now uh one of the interesting thing is your kinesiophobia score so kinesiophobia score is most of the times uh, seen in uh, athletes who have a injury and then going back to sports they have a fear of movement uh, a lot is seen on the back pain patients and in the knee patients where uh, particularly there is a pivoting movement where they feel that they might buckle and fall or they might lose their balance and fall so that is again one of the important aspects that has to be addressed uh, before they go back to sports some of the non modifiable factors will be your age so people with higher age will have uh, the chances of going back to an injury pre injury level is less men uh, have a better chance to get back to sports and only the elect uh, athletes can go back to their original level tissue healing now this is a very important things we should understand that uh, the every tissue what gets injured has a timeline for its healing so an exercise muscle soreness can last up to 3 days so somebody does a game uh, on the sunday can uh, carry forward that soreness for up to 3 days but more than 3 days if this if it does not subside then you should not play the consecutive day you should address it whether you need some uh, stretching or even more uh, extended recovery if there is a muscle strain and uh, grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 these are the possible duration that needs uh, recovery and uh, the ligament sprain so you can look at from the grade 1 3 days going uh, to grade 3 up to 1 year that's for your tendon bone if you're going to have fractures and other things the articular uh, cartilage repairs and ligament graft if there's going to be a reconstruction which can take up to 2 years now this uh, duration should be known by us so that most of the time when we deal with uh, the uh, basic injuries will be probably at grade 1 and grade 2 so which can be addressed with uh, our basic uh, pain management but when you put them back on to sports we should know that you need at least sometimes from 2 uh, days 3 days to weeks then comes the functional assessment so functional assessments are basic assessments uh, which uh, mimics the uh, sports movement and uh, they are uh, divided or classified as uh, strength based assessment agility based assessment power based assessment balance based assessment or neuromuscular control uh, based assessment so these tests are basically used to see whether all these components are uh, at a good percentage so that he can go back to his sports so why do we need to do a functional test because it gives you an uh it, they, those are objective tests and they can give you a quantitative scores and it can gain you a clinical confidence from the therapist prospect that you know that okay when you mimic the particular sports and he is able to perform yes you you are at a, uh, a documented quantitative level to say that okay now you can get back to your sports 
this is a, a simple uh, functional evaluation test what i use in my department so i i pick few tests which i am confident i know that uh, i can use them and if you see this it's got balance hop jump all these things now if you see a, a single leg hop this can be used for your ankle injury it can be used for your knee injury and even used for your core so only thing is what you are going to look at it and you write the comment on that so you know that okay i'm looking at whether the ankle synergy is working is strategies to balance on the foot is better so i will use the single leg hop based on that whereas if it is going to be knee i'm going to look at from the knee aspect and see how you can manage them so the current concepts in going back to the uh, sports this is an article recent article where they have given some uh, aspects they have also included not only getting back to on sports the nutritional supplement and psychological intervention which is the kinesophobia and getting back to sports at the older level or more and emphasis has to be kept on the training monitoring and the injury prevention programs if it is not been followed by an athlete that should also be started to implement so when you get a sports athlete if you look at the phases of management the initial phase is your protection and restoring range of motion strength and flexibility so this first phase is where we can use our modalities uh, we can use your taping you can use ultrasound pain management uh, manual uh, techniques uh, your soft tissue mobilization all of those things to come out of the healing process and restore the mobility after this comes your sport specific training achieving peak fitness then you have to have a reevaluation and then you go back to sports so you can broadly classify your athlete and tell them this is your stage then you have this stage and then you go back so the first stages you got to work initially to work on the pain relief on uh, the particular injury and try to improve your functional uh, uh, training so that will be your range of motion flexibility and strength and then you can start with some functional training so coming back on to the tissue healing what i earlier mentioned let's take a example so we have an a uh, subject a with a hamstring strain on the right side with grade 2 pain is around 5 and rom is painful when he does his uh, leg extension and there's no swelling uh, the subject b also has the same thing but if you look at what i have marked is the subject a trains and plays regularly whereas the subject b plays regularly but not much training and when i assess the patient with the opposite side and the other muscles he has a good strength and flexibility whereas the subject b has got a poor muscle strength on the opposite side and other muscles and there is muscle imbalance which i can look now to go back on to the sports probably subject a will be able to go back to active sports after probably 2 weeks if the pain subsides his all strength is good so he should be able to go back i can give him a timeline saying that okay you can go back in 2 weeks guarantee whereas a subject b who is going to be treated i will be able to tell him that your pain can go off probably in a week's time and we might be able to restore your mobility in a week's time so that will be 2 weeks but if i put him on a functional test i can see that you have very poor strength your functional tests are not going to be positives or in a good score so to go back on to the sports you might need another 2 months of rehab where you can clear your functional test only then you can go back on to the sporting field so this is my way of educating my athlete that you need to get your functional test also cleared and improve on these aspects of strength and muscle imbalance before you take up the sports so common injuries including uh, involving the structures can be your fractures dislocation common in ankle your tendon injuries particularly in the hamstrings foot then uh, they are classified again into tendinitis tendinopathy your ligament injuries you can have mechanical falls and muscle imbalance 
And what I have given here is some of the conditions uh, which they say uh, are coming from your fractures, which are treated conservatively as well as surgical, your hamstring strains, tears, avulsion injuries, your quadriceps strain and tear, your pes ansaris, uh, IT band friction, patella tendon insertion, TA insertion, ACL, MCL strains, you can have partial tears, surgical intervention for ACL and MCL, even for the meniscus, ankle ligament injuries, your lumbopelvic hip complex, which can have mechanical falls, which can have muscle imbalance, you can have a poor foot mechanics and muscle imbalance from the quadriceps to the hamstrings. Now, these are the possible uh, common uh, injuries we can come across our clinical settings. Uh, coming on a note on the tendinitis and tendinosis, now you can find a lot of the sports uh, doctors and the orthopedicians uh, trying to clinically diagnose uh, tendinosis and tendinitis. Both are two different aspects. Uh, in the clinical setting, how you can differentiate is tendinitis will be an acute injury, which is uh, uh, reversible and healing potential is more. Whereas in a tendinosis, it is a chronic problem where the player or uh, the patient will tell that he used to have this problem on and off for quite some time. It could be from six months to uh, two years. So that means what the, the tendon is more into a tendinosis where if they rupture, their healing is going to be very delayed. So if you can go on with their history, you will know whether it is more of a tendinitis or tendinosis. And in tendinosis, you have to be on a rehab where there is going to be a very good uh, strength of the uh, muscle, which will also make the tendon stronger. Only then you put them on back to sports. So when you have an acute injury, first time injury, it is tendinitis. Whereas if they do not do the rehab properly and go back, they tend to go into a tendinosis. And then later on, when they come repeatedly, it becomes a tendinopathy where there is a weakness of the tendon. And when they go and continue playing that, they can lead to the tear. The same thing goes with uh, the patella tendinopathy or the jumper's knee. So this uh, paradigm shift is happening now in the clinical settings. And uh, <clears throat> the common misconception about this is that tendinopathies are self-limiting and it can take only weeks to resolve. No, it can take maybe even months where it can try to resolve. Otherwise, you will have these kind of people who come every two weeks and telling that, oh, now again, I find a, a mild pain and a mild swelling coming over there, which is limiting. Again, you need to resolve and then go back. Uh, again, a surgical uh, intervention with this patient is not giving good results. Most of the time, they, they don't recover until unless they are uh, very badly having a, a tendinopathy. And uh, even the imaging is not able to predict uh, whether the prognosis is going to be good or not. So they have to take it very slow. And uh, the time to recovery is, is very common uh, to have even up to uh, 10 weeks to 12 weeks. But the likelihood of uh, healing in tendinosis is only 80%, whereas in tendinitis, it is 99%, very sure that they will be able to recover. Um, this is a, a very interesting one on the uh, petrofemoral pain, which is common in these days with a lot of people running or walking or even cycling. So most of the time you can find these patients complaining of pain, whether it is an open kinematic or closed kinematic at some particular angle. So what they found was most of the time the angle is somewhere close to the 45 degree angle when there is maximum uh, contact pressure coming at the uh, petrofemoral joint. And uh, some of the possibilities is to uh, continue the exercises by changing the momentum arm. So if you're going to do a single leg squat, what angle you change is going to change the momentum arm. So you can try and modify that or work strengthening at the angle, which is not painful. So if you can do a squat at 30 degree and if it is not painful, do only at 30 degree separate. 
and then cross the 40 degree to 45 degree and then do the other degree separately. When you do an open kinematic chain exercises, again, the petalofemoral contact is going to be maximum and cause the pain in these patients. What you can do is change the support arm. So this becomes a long lever. So you can move this slightly higher, make it shorter. So the momentum arm shortens up and again, work on different angles, work from 90 degree going up close to the 40 and only the terminal extension. So that in this period, your petlar tendon uh, uh, does not get to the process of getting uh, inflamed again, and you are able to maintain the quadriceps muscle strength all through the line. So from going to the sports, we need to start training first. So we need to make sure that there is no pain or sometimes there is maybe one, two. I sometimes start with my uh, patient complaining pain two, which I think that it depends upon the pain threshold. So no swelling, there is good flexibility, good strength and good eccentric strength is good. So I can start them off training. So when you look at your rehab, there are two things what you need to look. One is time-based and target-based. So what is the target here I'm giving is when I start, I tell him, okay, you need to have good quadriceps strength. So that's the target. And uh, you give him a time that, okay, you need to improve that strength in uh, four weeks. So that will be the time-based. So the four weeks time-based, what I give to that particular patient is based on the physiology of uh, how a muscle uh, atrophy to uh, progression to strength component is going to be there. I can't give him telling, no, no, you have to do it in two weeks because that is not going to be possible. So you give them and make sure the patient achieves the target in the time base. If the patient does not achieve the target and the time has come, you still progress the time until you achieve the target because the quadriceps symmetry is very important to your functional as well as sporting activity. So what can be the difference between a rehab and training? Rehab is mostly where we are looking at the pain and the mobility component and most clinical uh, uh, literature based, scientific based, whereas training can have a lot of variations, various methods followed by different people. So where we are not looking at people with pain and other things. So we progress patients from rehab to training or sometimes we merge the rehab along with the training. So the first aspect I always look at is whether they've got range of motion and then immediately go on to the proprioception and neuromuscular balance. So if you can see in this, uh, he is able to perform a, a single leg uh, squat and then perform the single leg squat on a balance board. That's your neuromuscular control. And then going on to the plyometrics where he is going to do a jumping activity. So when you achieve a range of motion, we need to make sure it is both the open kinematic as well as closed kinematic. And then this is the stage when you start preparing for strength. Proprioception, neuromuscular balance. The moment you weight bear itself, your proprioception has started. Make sure you're going to get good position sensors. That means you're going to have a good involvement of your kinesthetic sensation and see whether you can have controlled movement with proper muscles recruiting at the appropriate time. So that is your neuromuscular control. And uh, this will also make us uh, help our reflexes and protuberation training, our uh, protuberation strategies, what the body go on. Once this is good, you go on to the plyometric uh, aspects where you can improve on uh, explosive uh, power and uh, improve them on sports specific activities. Now, uh, to improve the proprioceptive uh, training, you need some facilitators. Those are verbal commands where you can talk to the patient, come on, try and move more, look at your hip as moving, uh, make sure your feet is kept down. And vision will be uh, inputs where the patient can see uh, himself in the mirror and make necessary uh, uh, corrections. Contralateral limb, give him a uh, feedback of doing a single leg squat on the contralateral limb and then make him do on the affected limb so that he can pick up the joint position sense and uh, range of motion, what he needs to do and the muscle recruitment he has to do and then use it on the injured leg. Sensory input can be in terms of tactile touch from the foot where you can use various surfaces, 
uh, you can use taping or the braces where they can help in improving the proprioception. So what is basically proprioception is the ability to sense stimulus. So the first thing is you should be able to sense the stimulus that when I stand, I know the surface is hard or the surface is little wobbly, or I can feel my uh, weight bearing going on my forefoot, on the hind foot. Then the person should be able to hold his body and uh, uh, hands or anything in, in even if there is a slight imbalance or if there is a blindfolded. So the Romberg test where we ask them to close their height sensor, that's one of the sensory input. So if they can do that, that is a good uh, proprioception that is available. If you look into the uh, literature, you will find proprioception and kinesthesia both used at various places. So if you see both are uh, not very different and both are not very uh, similar, it's just the understanding where those terms are used. Specialists from neurology, neurophysiology, neuropsychology, sports and exercise medicine, orthopedic surgery have different interpretation of these two terms. Some researchers define proprioception as joint position sense only, whereas kinesthesia as a conscious awareness of joint motion. Some consider kinesthesia to be a submodality of proprioception. So when you see literatures, you need to look at both and see how it is interpreted by those particular research people and then put across. Now, if you need to have proprioception, you need to have all the other uh, aspects, which is active range of motion, your sensory system, balance, joint synergy, all working together. Now, understand when we do a sports uh, management, anybody who has an injury, whether it's a sports people or uh, a different uh, person, whenever you have an injury, there is going to be a effect on the proprioception. If the proprioception is affected, the inputs that has been carried from different structures which was injured, your ligament, your capsule, your tendons, your muscle, all changes the way how the other system works. So we have to make sure that this system is put in back into place. These are some of the studies which shows uh, how important it is to have proprioception incorporated in a sports rehab. Uh, this was a paper where they uh, studied on the effect of the fatigue in uh, how it works on the knee proprioception. And what they found was when the knee uh, muscles are fatigued, the proprioception tends to uh, decrease and uh, cause uh, muscle uh, imbalance and the firing of the muscle is decreased, which can lead to a injury. So mostly when we train an athlete, we also train initially with proprioception and then later on we put them on a fatigue uh, program and then put them on a neuromuscular rehab. So we try to see whether when the muscle is fatigued, how they are able to have strategies to still try and maintain the balance. So these are some of the common methods you can use in a clinical uh, setup to work on uh, proprioception, joint position sense and neuromuscular coordination. You can use a balance foam. Sometimes I also tell the patient to use a pillow at home itself if you can't uh, have a, a balance foam. A trampoline can also be used, a BOSU ball and a balance board. So you can work on various aspects using these things. Um, so your proprioception training is basically joint portion, joint movement, weight bearing. Neuromuscular is eyes closed, eyes open, different environment, different surface. You can make low amplitude, high amplitude. So what does this mean? Low amplitude is I'm making them stand on a balance board and I'm going to slightly push him. So that is low amplitude that I will see that he can try and balance it. After that, it can be a slight more push. Maybe I can push him from the head. I can push him from the trunk on the shoulder level, from the uh, center of gravity and from the knee. Balance training going from uh, making the muscles working with stimulus and maintain a balanced structure in response. So I will try and throw the ball and ask him to hold and see whether he can still facilitate and hold the balance. And uh, the uh, physiological aspects when we are training for the uh, uh, proprioception, there is going to be training involved at three levels. One is at uh, spinal level, one is at the brainstem level, and then at the motor cortex level. 
So we have to make sure that the training is happening at all three levels and the body is able to sustain them, maintain them when you challenge them in the functional testing. So going from good mobility, I have this athlete doing a good squat with the tumbles on his hand. So I am very sure that he can do that. So from there, I will progress him to good mobility with control. So I can see that he can do a same squat on a balance board. He's able to. So definitely there is going to be an imbalance with the balance board, but I am seeing whether he has the control on that. So this is on a paper on uh, the uh, written to sports uh, decision making on an ankle sprain. This is a very recent uh, paper on uh, the systemic review, what they looked up. And uh, what they mentioned was some of the clinical uh, consideration is initially to look at uh, swelling, ligamentous laxity, and range of motion. So this is the first three criteria, which is commonly used by many people. And then they go on to the functional test where they look for proprioception, hopping and jumping, range of motion, balance, agility, speed and strength. So these were the common uh, features where everybody were looking at to make a decision. But the interesting aspect with them was none of them had a very conclusive uh, uh, aspect to tell that this is how you need to make your decision. This is one of our common tests I use for all my uh, uh, lower limb uh, injuries. So if you could have uh, seen how both these people are made to jump from a height, I am looking at how their overall jumping is there. And if you can see the uh, girl on the right screen, when she jumps, you can see she will jump on her forefoot, does not land on the hind foot and the knee goes to the valgus. So this is not a good sign. That means there is a muscle imbalance. Now, if I do a test for her to check the manual muscle testing and if I find all the strength is good, that means the strength is good. Only thing is her technique is bad. Then I have to go and train her technique where I can put her in front of the mirror and teach her how to land. So functional tests, again, there are papers which says now you, you need to have a proper uh, a functional test, which includes neuromuscular uh, coordination, check for postural defects, and uh, the maturation of the ACL graft. This particular test uh, paper was on the ACL. So the maturation of the uh, ACL graft is going to take up to nine months for a, a, a hamstring graft and for a, a bone patella tendon graft, probably about six months. Uh, this was a study on the ankle sprain on the hop test and the lateral uh, hop test. Uh, both the tests, when we look at the uh, lateral ankle sprain, uh, work on different aspects. The, the forward hop test is uh, in line with the uh, um, sagittal uh, plane, whereas the lateral one is going to be the frontal plane, which is going to put more strain on the lateral structures. And they found that the lateral hop test was more uh, informative than the forward uh, test. These are uh, some of the uh, workouts modification you involve with the hamstring injuries. So I'm giving him a, a balance board on the foot, slightly adding up imbalance along with the hamstring activation. And then you progress the hamstrings with a double leg uh, rolls and then progress it to a single rag rolls. So you slowly progressively load the muscles. Again, doing with a cis ball is going to add a little bit of imbalance, which will again help me in gaining uh, the neuromuscular control. Nordic hamstrings, uh, modified as well as the regular ones. So this is going to give me a very good eccentric loading of the hamstring, which is a, a very good way of strengthening the hamstring muscles. Neuromuscular control, standing on one leg and having a, a tilting board. So that is incorporating the control aspects. These are some stability drills you can work on football players. You can progress this from uh, standing on a normal surface to a foam pad where there is going to be a little bit instability and then you go on. 
This can again be used for ankle rehab as well as uh, knee rehabs. So the injured leg is the one that is on the floor. The good leg is the kicking leg. So we're looking at stability where you can balance in spite of your dynamic movements. So this is again uh, one of uh, uh, my knee patient. So he's just starting with a base level uh, kicking football drills. Protuberation training. So I'm mimicking him heading and I am going to give him pushes. So I will see whether he is developing strategies to control. So this will also take the kinesiophobia off. Remember I said that it is the fear of uh, falling or not able to hold. So I, I asked them to do them with their uh, partners and uh, progressing to drills where they can run. We can uh, do a side drill, but this is a very low intensity I'm giving. So he's just doing very uh, low intensity drills. The same thing uh, with the ball, he plays as an individual player. So I'm going to see whether he can control the ball and he's slowly gaining that confidence of his sports movement. So again, doing a low intensity drill of hops and jumps. So again, you can see that he's not doing at a, uh, his own capacity, but he's doing at a very small capacity. So this is just beginning uh, uh, after in the rehab phase. So then progress to high uh, digital, uh, agility drills of jumps. Then you can do hops of uh, different directions. So we are looking at uh, this again, a knee patient, whether he can have good stability over there. So two things we look at uh, when they hop and jump land. One is whether he can be stable and whether his distance, uh, distance what he covers is good. The last thing that has to be incorporated is plyometrics before you put them back on uh, the sports uh, because there is going to be explosive uh, strength uh, which is going to be checked and there's going to be speed involved. Uh, again, start with low intensity you are going to have a very short stretch and strong, uh, shortening cycle. So when you, when you actually have somebody jump, there is going to be a eccentric control followed by a quick concentric uh, push. So this uh, quick uh, is what we are going to look whether the uh, neural component can quickly fire in both ways where it can eccentrically control and as well as concentrically fire the athlete so that he can uh, have an explosive uh, power of the muscle. So these are some of the boxes that is uh, used for training at different heights. So you can work on uh, your intensity going from low intensity to high intensity. So you can have a program designed uh, with uh, height distance or using the medicine ball or even uh, they're playing equipment with them and you can vary the plyometric program then you need to have certain consideration do not give a plyometric program for children up to the age of 13. now this is something very common i see in a lot of these uh, kids who are uh, into academies and playing games where they are made into a lot of jumping activities uh, they are not to be done because the physis are still not closed. And whenever they use an explosive uh, uh, jump and other things, there, there is a possibility of a tendon pulling off or the tendon getting injured or the physis opening up and staying open or you can have calcification happening. So that is not to be done. And the body weight, people who are having a higher body weight in literature, that is 100 kgs. But even if you look, somebody is very obese and poor on strength, please do not put them. Competition involved, only appropriately people who are going to be competitive sports, you can put them on a high or uh, sorry, moderate or high level of plyometric. Then uh, look at the surfaces, what you are using. If your surface is not an ideal surface, make sure you have a good uh, footwear with that and modify the, uh, the intensity of the jumps. Then you put the plyometric and then progress it.
So these are some of the modifiable plyometric uh, drills you can do. Again, this is a very low intensity, but you are adding up uh, direction into them. So you can see that you, you are adding up jump and uh, uh, run. So you are adding up two components into them, followed by the third component of kick, which is going to be power using different legs. This is again changing directions. So this was earlier what I showed you as a protrubration training along with the plyometrics you can do. Most of the uh, athletes when they come, uh, I also ask them, do they have a fitness test done? So this is a great opportunity to educate uh, any people who uh, play sports, even if it is recreational. I tell them you need to have a fitness test and a sports specific fitness test. I introduce them to them and I tell them, okay, let's have a fitness evaluation done where you can have your height, weight, body mass, fat uh, using uh, maybe uh, your handheld machines or even the skin fold caliper. You do a test and put them on. I also use the FMS scoring where I can score how their movement pattern is or I can use some uh, uh, tests of speed agility. So I can, I use a simple fitness evaluation sheet. I write a test scores and give them and tell them, educate them that, okay, this is your score for today. Like how you have a clinical uh, master health checkup where you know what is your diabetic uh, heart rate or ECG you have with this because later on, whenever you have a, a sports injury, we will be able to track where your uh, uh, problem arises from. So the take home message is most of them want to have a roadmap during the first visit. So you can give them a roadmap telling, okay, this, your injury looks kind of this. You can tell them the pyramid. The first goal is to come off pain, range of motion, probably one week, two weeks, depending upon what kind of injury they come. Then you tell this is functional test. If you can clear the functional test, you can progress to playing. And uh, these days, everybody is aware of what a fitness test is because they have seen in TV, uh, read in newspaper about various international players undergoing fitness tests. So you can tell them why you need them. Uh, understand and teach them what is the difference between gym training and sports training. Both are different aspects. Just you do a gym training does not guarantee that you can play sports. Do a re-evaluation for strength, ROM and pain uh, after different stages of your uh, rehab. Uh, sports training to be staffed, uh, started only when there is no pain, stiffness and swelling uh, and there is good strength as compared to the normal leg. The balance and neuromuscular control training is very, very important in preventing injuries and getting back onto the sports. So thank you very much. I hope I have uh, tried to address what I thought was uh, appropriate. I hope it is of uh, helpful to everybody. Thank you so much, sir. It was really a uh, very informative session. And I hope a lot of doubts have been covered. Sir, we have a few questions from the audience. Can we go with it, sir? Yes. Uh, sir, there is one question from uh, Yogita More. Can you specify rotator cuff tear? What is general criteria after rotator cuff tear treated orthoscopically or open surgery or conservative management? Um, what, what, she wants the criteria. What was it? Can you specify rotator cuff tear? What is general criteria after rotator cuff treated with arthroscopy, open surgery or conservative management? Okay. I think she intends to uh, general criteria of return to sport, I think. If okay, rotator. Okay, I, I think that's the question what I am also assuming uh, what she wants. See, rotator cuff injuries, if they have to go back to sports, you should look at a timeline around uh, maybe around six to eight months. Again, uh, I want to know what kind of a rotator cuff injury they had. If it is a traumatic tear, yes, maybe six to eight months. But if it is a degeneration followed by uh, a tear, you might need maybe another uh, few more months, roughly uh, eight months to uh, 
one year when you look at rotator cuff injuries. If it is conservative, maybe three months, four months. Again, conservative, you need to know uh, which muscle is involved, whether it is the subscap or the uh, supra, and uh, whether it is uh, a tear uh, having anything that is less than five millimeter, yes, you can go back probably in three to four months. Sir, one more question is there. Uh, it's by Satvik Datta. Uh, how can we maintain physique to avoid detraining while off season? Okay. Off season is a time when there is no competitive uh, game happening. Most of them should be having a gymming program in the off season. Okay. And your gymming program should be based on what kind of sports they play. So you need to have components of strength and cardio in them. Then you need to know what are the deficiencies in that particular uh, individual. So you try and enhance those things in the off season. So this will be how you need to plan for the off season and give them. And during off season, they can, they can exercise gymming maybe five to six days a week. And if you want to improve strength, you can have uh, four sessions of strength training per week. But if you only want to maintain strength, then it's only two days a week. So, uh, one more question. Can a bucket handle tear of medial meniscus heal without surgery? With rehab, patient has no pain and it's been eight weeks. Patient doesn't play any sport. Okay. Um, see, meniscus uh, can heal, but uh, you know it's very difficult to say uh, uh, which uh, the outer zone can heal. Okay. Now, bucket handle tear uh, is a very difficult one to heal because it's more on the inner zone. Okay. One possibility is that if the uh, uh, tear is just staying just on place and there is not much movement happening where there is pivoting to push off that thing, there is a possibility they can, the patient can be asymptomatic. Okay. But if they are having some pivoting movement somewhere they do and that dislodges, they can go for locking. So you can educate the patient telling that meniscus does not heal. Your, your uh, meniscus, if it stays in its place without moving or dislodging off, you are not feeling pain and uh, locking. You can maintain your lifestyle. Okay, Over a period of time, it can probably just stay there stuck. Okay, so that is one possibility. So one more question from Abha Joshi. A patient 24 years old weightlifter has a knee pain while squatting and his end range knee extension is restricted. What could be his problem? Okay, uh, end range restriction is a, a thing what uh, you need to look at two things. The end range ex uh, extension is restricted means even passively it is not happening. That means something is tight posteriorly. But passively there is full range. That means your quadriceps uh, particularly if your VMO is not going and locking. If the posterior structures are tight, one is you need to look at whether the capsule is tight. Uh, sometimes uh, the, the capsule is tight along with the gastroc that they are not used to that complete extension. So that is one thing that can also inhibit the quadriceps from firing the terminal extension. So then you need to start stretching or releasing the gastroc and then start working on terminal extension. The best thing for terminal extension for me, for a weightlifter will be, you put them on standing, weight bearing, single leg, do a terminal extension. Maybe using a resistance band tied anteriorly and then ask him to do. So two more questions we will be having. Uh, so your comments on MPFL, medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction for patella and post-operative stiffness following reconstructions. I think it is uh, with respect to the sports returns only. Yeah, okay. Yeah. MPFL reconstruction for patella and post-operative stiffness. Uh, mostly we, uh, in, in my practice, we don't uh, see a stiffness. Uh, the range of motion initially uh, restriction is there because of patient's fear and pain. Okay. 
So you can start actually MPFL, uh, you can start your range of motion to have 90 degree by three weeks time. But if there is restriction, you can, uh, if the patient is uh, four weeks and above reconstruction, start with mild petla mobility, start on working on the rectus femoris because that's going to directly influence your uh, petla mobility. So start releasing the uh, rectus femoris uh, maybe work on the quadriceps isometric to see whether you get a very good contraction isometrics of hamstrings and you progress it, you will be able to get your range of motion. So we have one last question. Generally, orthopedic surgeons recommend passive mobilization uh, in rotator cuff injuries for six weeks. Please guide. Uh, passive range of motion in rotator cuff injury. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure uh, whether you need passive. You know, the, yeah. the physiotherapy progression is all active. Passive is, uh, uh, is, is not conducive now or not much of any use. So we, we go active. But uh, if the orthopedician says it's your job, you need to go and, you know, uh, uh, you need to... Um, back your findings with papers in literatures, which shows, okay, this, you evaluate and tell them. So in our practice, we start isometric straight away when there is acute pain and we start range of motion at the uh, pain-free range, whatever is possible. And once the pain subsides, we start progressing the uh, uh, range and strength as much as possible. That's it. Thank you, sir. Thank you for all the questions. I think most of the questions have been answered. Rather, all the questions have been answered. And uh, we will pro proceed to the vote of thanks. I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Avnish Manikar for the vote of thanks. Over to you, Avnish, sir. Uh, sir, you need to uh, stop screen share. My heartfelt get gratitude uh, to our dear sir, dear Ganeshan sir. He has put light on the return of the uh, return to the sports after the injury. My heartfelt heartfelt thanks uh, thanks to the IAP team, national team, the state team, who uh, especially Dr. Ujwal and Dr. Amit Gire, who were constantly supporting us uh, and guiding us. My sincere thanks to the uh, district to my district team. They were always been a great support. My special thanks to Dr. Vinod Kaushik from the IP Digital team. I would like to hand over this session to, uh, to him now. Thank you so much. Hello. Now one more speaker is there or not? No, sir. We are done. So okay. done. Thanks a lot, everyone. And uh, it's a really wonderful webinar taken by the speaker. I again thanks and I just uh, congratulate to the Nagpur team for organizing such a good webinar. In future, we will expect that you will go ahead for the more webinars with us. And I just again request everyone, please subscribe IP India YouTube channel. And uh, in the last, again, thanks to Dr. Sanjeev K. Jha and Dr. Ruchi Vashne, ma'am, for providing us this wonderful platform for sharing the knowledge. So thanks, everyone.